Hi, welcome to Queer View Mirror, a show about queer people, by queer people, for queer people, and our allies. I'm Scott. And I am Dawn. We are coming to you live from our studio here in Port Alberni, the unceded territories of the Tashop and Hupacheset people, where we live, love, and play. Welcome to the part two of our series of talks with Nicholas Sperling and Aaron LeBlanc. Today we're going to be discussing the turf issue, and you don't want to miss it. Yep, that's Queer Via Mirror coming at ya. Step up, climb in. We've been waiting for you. Come on, let's go. Wheels begin turning. My, we've come so far. Just think where we can go. Welcome to part two of our episode of Turf Talks. Today, joining us again is Nicola Sperling and Aaron LeBlanc. The conversation we had with Nicola and Aaron was so engaging that we didn't have enough time to put it into one episode, so we decided to do part two. So here it is. I've had uh, a JK Rowling fan stalk me and show up at my home, post my address on social media with my phone number and email and all of that. And uh, Mm. at the peak of when JK Rowling threatened to sue me, I was getting 10 hate messages a second. I had to do some math, figure it out, but you know, it's a ridiculous amount. And that was sort of the point when I realized that it doesn't make sense to try to respond to all of it. I have to be selective in what I respond to. So if someone raises a point that I think might resonate with that quote unquote movable middle, then I would address that point and make sure that my following and you know as many people as I can reach understand why whatever point is being made is not valid and I counter it um, with scientific fact and and um, when people are just raising points because they're trying to rile me up or uh, you know they've already been disproven many times and, and they're not getting the attention of the, the general public, I just don't see the need to respond to that because my time is, is too valuable to, to waste it on that. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I mean, and really, at some level, you just start encouraging them, right? Like they're looking for that response. They're looking for that emotional charge. And if you're not giving it to them, hopefully they just move on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That, but I would true. like to address they... the issue of the scientific facts. What scientific facts should we present to them or should we look into them or like, tell them to look at this scientific fact? What do we have to say about that? I like, think it depends on the... Fact? Issues. Yeah, I mean, I, it depends on the issue at play. So uh, it's sort of a difficult question to answer because generally what I'll do is if someone presents, let's say um, there was a Swedish study that went around that was talking about how trans people are, or um, transphobes have sort of interpreted to mean that trans people are more violent than their cis counterparts. And that's not actually what the study shows, but they'll use it for that purpose. So at that mm-hmm. point, you then have to look at the study and read through it and and say, well, this point actually disproves this thing that you you said, and um, just sort of dissect their points piece by piece based on the evidence that that we have in front of us. And the unfortunate reality is that you can have that study, which uh, the author has come out and said, no, this doesn't mean that trans people are more violent. There were, you know, all of these extenuating circumstances at play, uh, and you can you can pull all of that apart, and and still you'll get the other side saying, no, that's that's not valid. You say, well. You know, here's my breakdown. Here's what the author says, but they're so determined to believe what they want to believe that they're not yeah. willing to listen. And and that's another instance where I just think you have to sort of move on to someone who is willing to listen because you can only do so much to try to prove your point, and then it's it's up to the public to make that what they will. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and and that's exactly the point. I mean, they're coming out. I mean, I mean, Don and, and Scott, you both made a great a great comment that they're coming at it from an emotional point of view. And it, it's tough to, to, to sort of deal with a personal emotional uh, front of attack with scientific fact when mm-hmm. they're not going to be open to it. And, and Nicola, I, I'm familiar with that study, of course, and you're probably also familiar with the one where that turfs hang their hat on. They say that, you know, being transgender and transitioning is a lifestyle choice because there's a study out of, out of, this, out of Scandinavia that showed that, 
you know, 80% of people who transitioned detransition and go back to the gender that matches their sex assigned at birth. But when you look at the science of it, the people that they were selected really didn't fit the, the, the correct criteria for being transgender, number one. More than half of the people in the study that they followed, they couldn't find after the start on, on the, during the longitudinal study, they couldn't, <clears throat> they couldn't track down. So they assumed that they detransitioned, right? So there's oh. so much bad science in there. So, you know, just to, to show them the, how the, the, the methodology behind it just doesn't make, doesn't make sense, doesn't hold water. And then there's a great study out of um, the, the Cleveland Clinic that has done MRIs um, on transgender women um, on, on, on their brain development. And it shows that trans women's brains are very much, uh, are more similar as um, females assigned people assigned female at birth and are cisgendered than they are male assigned at birth. Mm. So if I'm assigned male at birth, but I transition to my correct gender, which was assigned at birth, my brain scans are more like a cisgendered woman assigned female at birth. Right? So it's just like, no, it's not that's a lifestyle. science right there. It's not a lifestyle mm -hmm. choice. And the Cleveland mm -hmm. Clinic is a very reputable scientific organization. Yeah. I mean, the same thing will be will be said about uh, suicide rates among trans people yes. and uh, folks will, will say that, well, after gender confirmation surgeries, the suicide rates don't go down. But what they fail to mention is that there's studies that will indicate that trans people who are in environments where they're supported mm -hmm. don't see those suicide rates that are significantly higher than the cisgender population. So uh, it's a lot of misinformation, a lot of... Um, sort of studies that are not taking place as well. There's not a lot of research that's being done and transphobes will sometimes take advantage of that and will claim that a lack of information proves that somehow trans people are, are dangerous or, right. or uh, however else they want to frame us uh, that's negative when in fact it's, it's, not, it's not a matter of the science showing one way or the other, it's just a matter of it not existing to be able to show one or the other. Yeah. I mean, and that's where we get into confirmation bias, right? So they've already decided that that, that uh, they've already decided one thing and they go looking for the information to back that up versus looking at the information and then making a, um, an informed decision, right? So um, that's what's happening. And they're listening to the famous people that are riled up. They're listening to the alt-right, the alt-religious right as well. Um, they're, they're buying into it. Um, and they, they just want to... Uh, there's somehow, I think it comes to fear of the unknown and fear of what they don't understand. And they're afraid of, of people like Nicola and myself. And what's to, like, what's to be afraid of? I mean, I think not your one of the other more beautiful than them. <laughs> <laughs> they're biased. I mean, so coming back to a point that was made earlier around how a lot of the focus is on trans women. Um, one of the big criticisms that we see is about trans women being allowed access to women's washrooms or women's yeah. change mm -hmm. rooms, mm -hmm. yeah. things like this. So that's a big conversation that's happening. And it, it's really interesting when you kind of delve into it because mm -hmm. what they're asking for essentially are uh, laws that will regulate who's allowed in which washroom. Mm -hmm. And that opens up a whole host of issues you know, are you having genital inspectors at washrooms or are you basing it on people's identification? In which case you're having people check IDs as you're entering washrooms. And also if you're doing that, then you're saying, okay, well, trans men are now supposed to use women's washrooms. So if your idea is that men are going to dress up as women to try to access women's washrooms, you've now made it easier for that to happen because they no longer have to dress up as women. They just have to say they're trans men, unless coming back to Yep. identification or genital inspections, you go that route, but then you're violating people's rights by doing that. So they just yep. don't think it through and they don't think of trans men or non-binary people as existing. Exactly. And, and you know, what the, what the facts show is there, there's more people that are accosted in washrooms by this gender police that are uh, in women's washrooms who are actually cisgendered 
Yeah. And, they're, <laughs> and someone thinks that they're transgender and they haul them out of the washroom when they get mm-hmm. the police, da, 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 and the identification and all that stuff shows that they're a cisgendered woman. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And, and it's a great point that a lot of people are focusing on trans women, but yeah, there's a whole population of trans men out there too, mm-hmm. that are impacted by a lot of this. And, and the, the next thing that they're hanging their hat on that they're going after is trans people competing in sports. Yeah. That's another issue I wanted to raise. What Which do you have is, to say about that? Has no validation. I mean, there's, there's mm-hmm. no trans woman that has been, you know, beating the beating uh, everybody in their event in the Olympics. Um, and, you know, they, there was a, a case in upstate uh, New England of uh, high school um, students where two cisgendered girls, athletes, or actually many cisgender girl athletes, um, took the task to uh, trans um, women athletes in their high school who transitioned in high school and they were in track and were winning all the track events. And th- that whole community got up in arms. Well, they shouldn't be competing as women. They are, they are not women. Well, yes, they are. Mm-hmm. They just happen to be better than you in yeah. that event. And what was interesting is that the, the complainants, when they went on to college to compete in their sport, one didn't make a, the team at all because they got beat out by cisgendered women mm-hmm. coming from other parts of the country to that, to that university or college. And the other two never won events. So they're just better than you. That's all. They, they ran faster. You yeah. came up against women that ran faster than you. It's, it's... They got enough sleep. <laughs> I, think what's so interesting, uh, I think what's so interesting about this conversation is that when it comes to a lot of sports, it doesn't really matter. Like most people who are participating in sports are not participating in a high enough level yes. that it really matters if there's a minute difference of performance so we're really only talking about a small group of people that compete at a very high level that require some kind of regulation if if we're going to maintain you know gendered segregation Um, but when it comes to those high level athletes you then have to look at the statistics and the statistics don't indicate that trans people are any more likely of uh, to win a competition in fact it shows the exact opposite and obviously that's because we haven't gotten to a point where enough trans people are competing at that level to really garner useful statistics, mm-hmm. but you can't claim that there's an issue if the statistics are, are not showing that one exists. And yes, you have do. to expect, they, they do, but you have to expect that there are going to be some trans people that are going to win competitions, Eventually. even at an Olympic level, because in order for it to be fair, the percentage of trans people winning has to be equivalent to the percentage of trans people in society and right. that's when you know that you have you know a, a fair uh competition right. and we're not there yet so mm-hmm. uh, until we get there and and you know if we were to start seeing a lot of trans people dominating or a lot of trans women dominating women's sports sure okay maybe we need to look at different regulations but i would argue that we shouldn't actually be looking at how to segregate people by gender because it's not a very effective way of creating fair competition what you really need to be concerned about are physical attributes that uh make people more um dominant at a sport than other people Mm -hmm. and uh, they do this in uh you know weightlifting or boxing they've got weight classes for people they they don't segregate people uh, well they do by gender but there's also other ways of segregating people so that you can create Mm -hmm. fair competition exactly yeah, like yeah. like the weight classes in boxing, you you box by your weight, right? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. as an as an example, yeah. Well, I'm just curious again. I'm just going back a little bit to Caitlin. Wasn't she named Woman of the Year? So, what did the Turfs have to say about that? How can they she be named? It. I mean, by- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't know for sure, but we're pretty sure they hated it. Oh no, they they made it very clear at oh, the time. They? They hated oh yeah. It. Oh yeah. 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 Oh really? All over yeah. the internet. Yeah. Yeah. She's, yeah well, she's- <laughs> According to them, she's not a woman. So, right. yeah. So, how can she be woman of the year? Yeah, so, exactly. And yet, she's on their side. I really, I really can't. Like, it's all muddy. That's got to say. I, I believe she even said at one point that she thought trans women should pee in men's washrooms. And what? 
yeah she's got a big house with tons of washrooms so maybe it's not an issue for her but the rest of us are out here going i that's not really safe for us you know oh yeah exactly <laughs> good grief exactly <laughs> amazing it's not safe and you, you know, know on the island there's several um uh restaurants nightclubs um mm -hmm. shopping malls um that have unisex bathrooms mm -hmm. Mm -hmm where you walk in and everything's a stall or you walk in and yeah. it's just a single use bathroom. Mm -hmm, exactly. And wouldn't that solve so many problems? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, and, and you go in Europe and, and the stalls are actually floor to ceiling. Like there's no, mm -hmm. you can't see on feet underneath. You can't, you know, look, oh, it's just, it's a stall and people are going what they need to do and, yeah. and, and that's it, right? And, and the interesting thing is, is that they're claiming that um, this means that, you know, if you allow trans women into women's washrooms, it means that there's going to be more attacks. You know, we need a law to prevent that. You do have a law that that's called, you know, it's, it's already on the books. It's called assault exactly. or assault. sexual assault. Exactly. Sexual assault. There's already laws Regardless of gender. That, that type uh -huh. of behavior illegal. Mm. So, yeah, why are you wasting our time on this? And again, the stats don't show it. The stats don't back it up. Well, you know, I mean, largely people are going into the bathroom for one thing, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the piece mm -hmm. that they keep missing, right? Nobody's going to spend time in a bathroom for the sake of spending time in a bathroom. Yeah. Well, I would just I mean, with all the with all the proliferation of free porn anyway, who needs to go do a voyeur in a washroom anyway? <laughs> Well, speaking of people getting attacked in washrooms, this happened to an ex-partner of mine. We were on BC ferries and uh, someone went into the men's washroom while he was in there and kicked the door down and told him he wasn't allowed to be in there because he was actually a woman. So it's, it, it's the wow, trans wow. people who are at really? risk of being attacked yes. in these washrooms. Yeah, exactly. And mm. the, you know, coming back to those full height doors that you mentioned, mm -hmm. that's something that I've been a big proponent of. I run a construction company. So for me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have gendered washrooms because you're doubling the amount of plumbing that you have to put in a building. So from a purely cost perspective, mm -hmm. it makes more sense to have gender neutral washrooms. And then as someone who deals with social anxiety, I would love to have full height doors. It would be yeah. so much less stressful being in a washroom with full height doors. Mm -hmm. And who really cares about washing their hands next to someone of the exactly. opposite gender? It's not, it's not that big of a deal. No. Yeah. For the rest of us in the alphabet, the LGBTQs, et cetera, how can we best support our teens? Good question. I, I think that, so one of the things that I've been sort of a big advocate for, and uh, actually there was an article in the Georgia Strait recently that I was quoted in, was the difference between how society deals with homophobia as compared to transphobia. Because I think we have a fairly good sense of what actions or uh, types of speech would be considered homophobic but I think a lot of the population isn't in tune with trans issues and doesn't recognize when transphobia is happening. And I think there needs to be much better education around that because in order for us to be able to get ahead of this and be able to confront the transphobia that we're facing, we need for our cis allies to be able to recognize what it is that's transphobic and then to call that out and to you know, act as allies in that sense. Um, and, and also just as a, a, another topic that, we sort of touched on briefly, but actually is quite a large conversation within the, the turf population, and that's prisons uh, and how we treat women in, in prisons. And I think there's this idea that we need to look at, you know, are trans women or trans men more or less likely to offend than their cis counterparts who are being placed in the same prisons? But the reality is that no one should be put in a position where they're getting raped in a prison, like regardless of whether they're men or women, that's up to prisons to be able to control, you know, whether a, a sex offender is being placed in general population and has a high risk of offending in that situation. That's, it's not really a trans issue, but it's, it's being made into one. Yeah, it's a human rights issue. Right. Right. So, like, well, we as far all as the right, law is concerned, race, race, what so. what are laws that are pro trans and what are laws that you are aware of? Yeah, I mean, the, the laws are actually going there to protect the yeah. the youth, and it, and like Nicola just says, it's and I've always said, it's not a net zero sum game. If I get protections and rights, it doesn't mean I'm taking away those from you. Yes, exactly. Right. So that's that's the thing, and and 
Um, Scott, your, your question is a great question. And what I always say to individuals, you know, um, to, to be an ally is to, to call out the behaviors, as Nicola mentioned, um, because silence is tacit approval. Their, their view, I suppose, is that um, kids are being told in schools through things like SOGI education that they can be trans, and that's a possibility in life. And they're extrapolating that as meaning that schools are trying to turn <laughs> kids trans. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's complicated to describe because I, it, it's not real. It, it's, it's not yeah. happening. <laughs> no, no, I think what's, that's, what's that's happening that's is they're encouraging children to be open and they're encouraging children to be like, there is a place, there is a safe place to discuss this and have the conversation. Right. Isn't that so, what, yeah, I mean, what, those, right? what those programs do is they encourage individuals to be their authentic self. Yeah, and it's, it, you're not going to turn someone gay. You're not going to turn someone trans. You know, um, I don't want you hanging out with that with that trans kid because they're going to make you trans. No, they don't understand that way. It's just fear. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is that um, they're seeing an increase of people coming out to their authentic self, mm -hmm. and they think that that means there's the incident rate is increasing when it's not. It's just more people who would not have come out in the past. Mm -hmm. are now coming out so that the number the percentage of the population is the same it's just we're coming out more because now there's more supports we feel more mm -hmm. confident we feel more comfortable i mean when i was first diagnosed back in the 80s there's no way i was coming out that would have yes. been a crap show um but as you know supports became available as i became you know you know more emotionally and, and uh, mentally and psychologically um ready i came financially ready I, it, my family was ready, the laws were ready, medicine was ready, workplaces were ready. I was in a more supportive environment to come out. And for, for the young kids, they're seeing a more supportive environment. So, you know, the TERFs and the alt-right think that schools are making gay people and trans people out, out of these programs when they're mm -hmm. not. They're just no. allowing them to be their authentic selves. And isn't that a beautiful thing? It is. And, you know, I mean, realistically, if that worked, then, you know, Don would be straight, I would be straight. This is our lived experience, right? It was always yeah, exactly. in school trying to fit in with everybody else. Yeah. So, you know, the logic, again, the science, it doesn't hold up to the science. Yeah. Well, the tragic and, and part we, is we get persecution from our own community. I mean, you guys get yeah. persecution from even the LGBTQ community because the guy we're talking about is part of the LGBTQ, but mm -hmm. he has renounced his membership in the LGBTQ and just is just G. No, no LGBT. LGB or whatever. Right. It's like the LGB Alliance, which is a hate group that yeah. claims to be operating on behalf of LGB people, but in reality, they're aligned with you know right-wing extremists and religious yeah. groups in the U.S., yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. I have to ask this. Do you think, Aaron, Nicola, that this issue is sort of like magnified in this day and age? Because it, this wasn't be the, the conversation about trans community and trans people wasn't as pronounced as loud as what we're having now. Do you think, why do you think that is? Oh, it's, it's, it's Twitter. It's the, it's the Insta. Uh, yeah. You know, it's social media, um, you know. And, and we're getting rights, like, you know, around the world, we're seeing that trans people are getting rights and, and the people who see uh, equality as oppression are pushing back against that. Exactly. Like, oh, hold on a second. Yeah. We don't, we don't want you to have rights. We want, we want to, uh, to stop this from happening. And so how are we going to do that? We're going to become extremely vocal. So they're a, a very small minority, but they're a very vocal minority. And yeah. um, they're, they're spreading their messages online. And uh, those online platforms are not doing a particularly good job at shutting it down. So that's, yeah. I think, why we're, we're seeing so much of that. And then you add celebrities like J.K. Rowling and, and Dave Chappelle. And um, I, I'm not going to give too many other people airtime, but um, okay. you know, <laughs> I think they add to that conversation. Yeah, I, yeah, they're they're quite happy when we're oppressed, and then suddenly they feel threatened when we're getting rights, thinking that they're going to lose theirs. Mm. Yeah, I it know. doesn't hold water. Yeah, I okay, think nice. you really hit on that, Aaron. And you know, the more rights other people, other groups get, doesn't mean less rights for everybody else. It's you know, to quote you, uh, not a what is it, net zero gain. 
Yeah, like, net zero sum game. Yeah. There we go. Net zero sum game. Like it's not like you can't. No, it's not. It's not about the pie. Who gets the bigger slice of the pie? It's about equality. Yeah. yeah. Let's just get a bigger pie. Come I just now. hope that the course, solution is, you know, is not to keep fighting, and it's that we're going to see a greater level of societal acceptance. Um, conversations like this help. Um, people like uh, Nicola who do amazing things help, um, which is what what we need to do. We just we need to be almost as vocal as they are, but you know, don't don't use the same tactics they do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, um, don't use fake news. Try and stick to the science and base and and and, and authoritative facts. Not the emotions. Um, don't don't get down in the dirt. Like I would. You know, I know what's come out with she who must not be named, um, but I would never, ever publish someone's home address, regardless of who they are. I'm not going to go that low. I'm going I'm yeah. to keep keep fighting at at uh, at the high thing and and fight for, you know, um, the rights to improve everyone's lives. Absolutely. Well, I like what you said, Aaron. Let's stand our ground and you have our support. <laughs> so let's do this. <laughs> Uh, that was such a great conversation. I'm glad Erin and Nicola took the time to join us in that episode. What do you think of that, Scott? I'm always so inspired when I have conversations with Nicola and Erin, and I'd like to take this moment just to thank them so much for joining us today. And I think what we're going to find is um, what side of history we're all going to be on. Just like 20 years ago when there was a big debate about gay marriage, and here we are, and doesn't that just seem like horse and wagon times? Well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you for joining us. We'll catch you next time on Queer View Mirror. Hey, now I'm glad you're here. I want to hear your point of view. I just might learn something that I never knew.